Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Eric Edmeads. He's an author, coach, and creator of the popular Wild Fit program. Eric spent the earlier part of his life struggling with constant sinus and throat infections, excess weight, acne, and chronic fatigue. He was actually set to have his tonsils removed, but on a whim, he decided he was going to change his diet. And within 30 days, all of his symptoms disappeared. And of course, the surgery was canceled. Eric knew at that point he had to share what he learned with the world. So in this episode of the Health Fix podcast, Eric Edmonds and I talk all about why sugar really isn't evil, how sinking your diet to the sub-Saharan seasons of your ancestors can optimize your metabolism. Plus, we get real on managing your multiple personalities when it comes to food. This one's a funny one. We go into concepts I have never discussed before in the podcast, and we have a ton of laughs. So I have no doubt you'll enjoy this podcast. Let's introduce you to Eric Edmeads. Hey, Health Junkies. I have Eric Edmeads on today, and we're going to be talking about a subject that I love because, let's put it this way, I give folks information. I let it, them kind of marinate in it, and then we hope that that information is taken and utilized, but sometimes we need a framework. So we're going to talk about Eric's book, Post-Diabetic Frameworks in Helping Folks, really to conquer this, this diabetes thing we got going on in across the world, but in the United States in particular. So Eric, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Well, as we were chatting just before we hit record, one of the biggest struggles that anyone probably in the medical field has is having all this information that we're like, I'm so excited to give you this information. It's going to change your life. But it's just information. It's not something that's going to have actionable steps. And so obviously you've seen this too, being in the the industry and working with folks and having your successful WildFit program. So tell us a little bit about what you were thinking about when it came to the book post-diabetic and and the framework that you have written into it to help folks really get over this addiction to sugar and foods like that. Absolutely. Well, and the funny thing is it didn't actually start with diabetes at all. Um, It really started with a very simple thing. And that was that I had had uh, a significant health turnaround recovery in my, in my early twenties. And uh, my appearance changed so dramatically that of course, many of my friends were asking me, Hey, <laughs> like I'll have what you're having. And um, what I found though, was that I could give them very good information about what they should maybe eat more of, or they should eat less of or whatever. And they'd be very inspired. And perhaps for a meal or two, they would follow the guidelines I gave them. And then they'd make an exception and then they'd make the next exception. And then of course the exception becomes the rule. And so many years later, and, and of course, in the middle of all this, I was so fascinated by nutrition and psychology that I, I continued to treat it like a very dedicated hobby, but I stopped trying to help other people because they just didn't seem to want to be helped. Yeah. Then I got involved in teaching business and entrepreneurship. And my clients would often ask me, you know, where I got all my energy from. I'm on stage for 10 or 15 hours a day for multiple days in a row and I'm flying and I'm not getting any sleep. And how, how is it I'm, I got all this energy and I get sick and what have you. And so it kind of got me back to speaking about that. But again, I ran into the same frustration. I'm sharing ideas that I know work, but they're not sticking with them. And so it was at that point that I decided to do a really deep dive and create a transformational framework. And we were using many of those tools in our business coaching practice already. And so we formalized it and we created something called behavioral change dynamics. And now all of our video programs, our live event experiences and coaching programs are built on that framework. So I decided it's working in business. Let's do it with food. And we launched our first ever uh, program a little over 10 years ago now for eight people, eight people in a single class. And they went through the process and, you know, like it worked for all of them. Like they all got massive benefit, which of course, statistically is not the way the diet industry typically works. But it's also highly anecdotal. It's a one-off case, right? You can't, mm-hmm. you can't. oh, we've, we've invented something brand new that's mm-hmm. going to work for everybody. So we did another class of eight and then another class of eight. And we kept doing that for a while, collecting data, making modifications to the program to improve efficacy and what have you. And then one day, one of our clients said, hey, can I tell my, my, my list about your program? And we, don't, we didn't even have a website. The only way you could buy the program was to come to one of my business programs. 
So we quickly put up a website and a year's worth of clients signed up in two days. And rather than having a class of eight people, I now had to host a class of 200 people. And it was a big change, but the statistics were outstanding. Now, it continued to grow largely based on word of mouth. So we went from our little coaching practice of 150 clients a year to 3,000 clients in a year to 5,000 to now we've had over 100,000 people go through this program. And at some point uh, early on in the fourth or so year, we noticed that we were getting a lot of people telling us that they that they were now pre-diabetic. And usually if somebody goes, oh, I'm pre-diabetic, normally that's bad news, right? Uh, oh, you weren't and now you are. But with our clients, it was actually good news. They were going, well, I'm now pre-diabetic, but I was type 2 diabetic. <laughs> and, and, and then in the middle of all that, I began to realize that it irritated me. It irritated me that people were referring to it as pre-diabetic when you were going the other way. Like, yeah. it, 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 I, I realized that, you know, look, if you had type 2 diabetes and you've now say reversed it and you're now back in pre-diabetic range, it's wrong to call that pre-diabetic because pre means before. It, it indicates a trend, even if it's at a subliminal psychological level, but also in, in a very important way, it has something to do with the way the medical advice should be dispensed to that person. So you, you could have two people that are in that same pre-diabetic range but if one is trending toward type two diabetes, they require different medical advice than somebody who's trending in the other direction. And mm -hmm. so we started referring to those clients as post-diabetic mm -hmm. and trending toward full reversal. And that is what gave birth to, you know, the, the early, the early decision to start doing this book. It was like that, that was the beginning of it. And then a few more really interesting events happened. It was like, then it felt destined. There's no question. We got to get the book out. <laughs> makes sense. Makes sense. I love the term post-diabetic. I mean, it does make, you know, it is one of those things where someone's like, all right, I'm not diabetic anymore. Now I'm just pre-diabetic. And like you said, it's like that weird, like, wait. Yeah. And there's two, there's two sides to that. The, the one is, okay, I'm not diabetic. I'm not type two anymore. I'm now pre-diabetic. And of course, as we talked about this sort of subliminal, you know, uh, message that you're heading towards something, there's that. But the other thing is, is that even for somebody who brings their A1C right out of the pre-diabetic range and become fully reversed, we still refer to them as post-diabetic because the, it, clearly they have either a genetic, epigenetic, or simply lifestyle that has trended them in that direction, making them possibly more susceptible than someone else. So what that means is that person, even when they fully reversed it, that person is post-diabetic and should be aware that they could transition back to diabetes if they allowed those old behaviors to come back. So that 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 whole identity of post-diabetic is incredibly important to the recovery. Mm, I like that. I like that. I'm I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna use it. Uh, one of the things that you know we had talked about too is is really the behavioral change because a lot of people know that yes, if if I've been diagnosed you know, as having a blood sugar issue, we'll keep it at that for right now, then folks are going to be like, okay, do I absolutely have to cut out all sugar? Do I absolutely? And, and there's this loop. And I love that in your book that you're kind of giving folks that like first week to really be like, all right, let's, let's get some info down here. Give us a little scoop on that whole, like, all right, that's it. You got to cut it out of your life and how that leads to some behavioral change issues and why you have it in your book where it's like, okay, we're going to ease into this a little bit. And here's yeah, I'm absolutely. Doing. Well, I, I think the first thing is to solve any problem, you have to understand the cause properly. And I think that, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that in a large, say, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a large selection of what we might call the larger medical community, uh, diabetes is treated as a, quote, lifestyle disease. And then it's considered to be a chronic condition that will need to be medicated for the balance of a person's life. So, so what I would suggest, the first thing we had to look at, and the reason the book has that structure that you're describing is that, um, well, consider it this way. How long does it take to create diabetes type two? How long does it take? Well, that depends a lot on the way you live, or you could even say it depends on what decade you were born in. Because you see, if you were born in the fifties or sixties, then it took some 20, 30, or 35 years to create type 2 diabetes. In the 1970s, for those people, almost nobody under 40 was type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So the food industry at that stage uh, was such that, and, and the general habits of the population were such that it took 30 years to create type 2 diabetes. Now, 
that's accelerated. The food industry has changed. The, the, the level of processed food and seed oils and unconscionably you know, common sugars and fake sugars and what have you has exacerbated the problem so that now we have teenagers that are pre-diabetic and that's a frightening idea. But even so, we can minimally argue that it takes about 10 years to create the condition. But what we also know is that it can be, in most cases, it can be reversed within about eight weeks. Wow. So there's a clue in that. There's a clue in that. And the clue is, is that let's say you work diligently over a 10 year period to create the condition. You, 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 you definitely eat a lot of the wrong things. You don't eat a lot of the right things and you don't move enough and all that kind of stuff. You do all the things they're going to, well, you, if it takes 10 years to create it, you have to kind of imagine your body was resisting it the entire time. It didn't want to go that way. It, it kind of eventually just gave up. And all you have to do is tip the scales back in that direction, even slightly, even <laughs> slightly and, and the things can change. So Let's go back to this question of the cause. Uh, you know, as you know from the book, we're basically proposing that the 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 primary cause of type two diabetes is um, a divergence from our natural lifestyles, what we call the evolution gap. That you know, our 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 energy management systems, our metabolism evolved for a particular lifestyle, and we've altered our environment so substantially that our management system doesn't really work very well. In other words. Our ancestors lived with seasonal availability of carbohydrate foods, and we live with constant availability of both bad and, and functional carbohydrate foods, but constant availability. And that is a primary trigger in, in the disease. So now what happens is, and you've seen this time and time again, baby bathwater. Oh, look, sugar's the problem. Sugar's evil. You got to get it out. Well, you know, the first problem with that is that the average person has such an incredibly strong emotional tie to sugar that if you were to say to them, you can never eat sugar again, they'd rather die. I mean, metaphorically anyway. <laughs> and, and and I think this is very similar to the principle of Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't go to your first A meeting and they go, well, the only requirement for membership is that you give up drinking for the rest of your life. They say that the only requirement for membership is a desire to give up drinking. And then after that, they adopt this, the idea of one day at a time. Now, what we've taken a look at with, with, with respect to sugar is that our ancestors clearly had a relationship with sugar. So for anybody, any Instagram influencer to say sugar is evil, well, they're patently wrong. There are definitely evil sugars and there's evil implementation of sugar and, and that sort of thing. But what we're suggesting is that by changing our relationship and our seasonal relationship with sugar, we can tip the balance back and we can either prevent or reverse the, the, the diabetic conditions. Mm. You know, I think that's important to recognize that for a lot of people, because of course, I've kind of went down the route of like, okay, how do we get someone off sugar? Do we just cold turkey? Do we, you know, do, do we ease off? Do we do this? Do we do that? But the seasonal thing is very fascinating. And I think for a lot of people, it's tricky to understand because of the grocery store, right? We've got yeah. bananas all year. We've got oranges all year. And I think a lot of people are, are, have no clue what's even in season when. What kind of resources do you provide for folks to, to help them kind of understand what's what? Okay, so um, that, that issue of the grocery store is really important. I, I lived yep. in Ireland for a year. And when I got there, what we found is that we could only get oranges occasionally because they only imported them from Spain. So we were on a seasonal cycle. We could never get mangoes. They, they didn't fly them in and bananas were available and then they weren't available and they weren't available. But, but very rapidly, and this is, we're talking 15, 20 years ago, very rapidly, we got to the place where oranges were there every day. Bananas were there every day because they're, when they're in season in Costa Rica, we go get them from there. When they're in <laughs> season in Guyana, we get them from there. And when they're in season in Africa, we, you know, so you're absolutely right. We've messed with that seasonality, but there's another very important thing to recognize. And that is that we're not talking about your own localized seasonality. Mm. What we're really talking about is the, um, the seasonality that our, uh, that our species and our, and, and, and our predecessors evolved to respond to. So that's not the seasons of Detroit or the seasons of Paris or the seasons of, you know, Perth. We're talking about the seasons of sub-Saharan Africa, where our species and ancestors spent 99% of our time evolving. So we evolved a metabolic, a metabolic system that that was specifically designed to help us not starve to death on that seasonal cycle and to utilize those seasonal cycles. So, you know, as you know, we go from, uh, you know, we, 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 we can certainly metabolize fat and then we know we can also metabolize sugar and we know we can also metabolize protein. 
And, and on a proper seasonal rotation, we will burn all three of those fuel sources every year. But the average American or the average European, for that matter, will only ever burn sugar all year long. And so that's part of the, this issue is understanding that it's not about mimicking necessarily your local seasons. It's about activating the metabolic modes that we evolved to survive those seasons. And the seasons that we're talking about are, you know, really, really more of sub-Saharan uh, African. What I mean by that is that, you know, you've got this fall season where you've got like uh, fruits and berries are on the trees, the root vegetables are plentiful, there's honey uh, everywhere with all the blossoms and what have you. And, and, and uh, with all the flowers, I should say, uh, from from previously, so you've got that carbohydrate season, then immediately following that season, you would go into a period of, of incredible calorie restriction, you would go into a season of winter, um, drought, and what that would mean is very, very low food availability of any kind. Then you'd move into spring, which would be triggered by the rains. Now with the abundance of water, there'd be lots of plants, mostly fresh young greens, and hunting would become prolific and amazing. And so as you run through that cycle, you can see we're going to burn sugar when sugar is available. When we go into calorie deprivation, we're going to we're going to burn both fat and protein, you know, in uh, um, uh, which is an important function of the body. And then when we move into that season of uh, calorie surplus, but no carbohydrates, we're going to burn primarily fat, and we're going to build muscle mass and what have you. That understanding that metabolic cycle and recognizing that the average American never runs it, well, explains a lot of the metabolic disorder that we've got. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've ever really thought of it that way. I've seen different articles and things. Now, of course, to give folks a little background, now you spent some time in Africa with Bushman studying yep. eating patterns. And so I'm guessing that a lot of this is coming from, from that and what you learned at, at, on your trips there. Could you give folks a little bit of background there so they kind of bring it full circle in their head? Sure. There, there's a First, there's a little logical thought exercise that's worth, worth undertaking. You imagine that you got yourself an exotic pet. And now you have to figure out how to feed and walk and water your pet, but you don't know what its requirements are because it's exotic and there's not common knowledge about that, like with cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. So what are you going to do? Are you going to go to Harvard research papers and PubMed and look for studies on that exotic pet that were likely funded by Purina and other pet food manufacturers? Or are you going to watch the Nature Channel and watch a two-hour special on your exotic pet? Which one is going to give you a better idea of the way that pet should live? I think we know the answer. <laughs> So using that logic, using that sort of idea, what I would suggest is that we're able to draw on two different sources of information that can really, actually three different sources of information that can give us some clues as to the way uh, we evolved our relationship with food and the way our metabolisms evolved. So the first one is, is quite tangential, but it's important. And that is the other primates in our family. So bonobos and chimpanzees. You know, we, we share more DNA with the one than the other does. We are unbelievably similar. Now, I'm not suggesting we're all supposed to give up our lives and live like chimpanzees. But what I'm suggesting is, is that there are some clues in their relationship with food that we can be paying attention to. And by the way, we know that their diet consists of seasonal fruits and vegetables and meat. We know that. And so that's interesting. Then the second place that we can look at is our own archaeological record. Now, my great grandfather discovered the oldest Homo sapiens skull, and I held a cast of it at the National Museum in Bloemfontein when I was 12 years old, and it activated my imagination. What was life like for this person 259,000 years ago? I mean, that's incredible. And then on top of that, my, my uh, same great grandfather excavated most of the caves on that southern coast of southern Africa, and people have been living in those caves. And just think about this number for a minute. If we think of a very old building in Europe being, say, a thousand years old, a thousand, like, you know, ancient Greece, you're talking a few thousand years old, right? Like that, you know, that kind of thing. People have been living in those caves for 200,000 years. They make ancient Greece look like yesterday. And of course, the beautiful thing about those caves is that when people live in caves, they drop what they're doing, they drop what they're eating, and they create something called cave litter. So the cave floor is constantly rising up like this. And, and so, of course, they've dug down into that cave floor, when one of the caves in particular, and they put glass walls up so that you can walk down and look at roughly 200,000 years of, of human eating. And so we, we have some serious clues about the human diet from there. And then, of course, the third one is the one that you raised, and that is that many years ago, over 15 years ago, I was invited to go visit a hunter-gatherer tribe in East Africa called the Hadzabe people. 
And um, I, I was aware they existed, but I, I had no idea that their lifestyle still persisted at that stage. And I made my first visit then. And I've basically visited them like frequently over the last mm -hmm. 15 years. And that really has shaped a lot of my thinking around our eating patterns, both in terms of the material realities of what our ancestors likely ate and what our present day or say contemporary hunter gatherer people are eating today, but also the timing of when they ate it and the, the type of exercise they did relative to eating it. And I think that, yeah, there's some really valuable lessons in that. It's been life-changing for me to spend that. Matter of fact, that the, the bow and arrow on the wall behind me there, that was a gift from the chief when he made me an honorary member of the tribe after 15 years of, of friendship. Oh, wow. I was going to ask because I have my eyeballs on it back there going, hmm, I wonder if that comes from from there as well. So cool. I mean, I love being able to visit different cultures and, and I haven't had this experience like, like you have had. Um, and, and I heard something possibly that you have members that you will take down to as well. Did I hear something about that or you? Yeah, or? you know, when I first did it, um, it was just my own personal exploration and and you know, if I was in Africa, I used to run leadership programs where I took people up Kilimanjaro as part of this leadership exercise. And, you okay. know, and, and would often go do the visits after that. But there came a point where um, some years ago, I was in Africa with one of my wild fit coaches, Yvonne, and um, a couple of friends of mine who were photographers, one of who, who is now my 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 life partner, my, my girlfriend. And, but back then she was just one of our photographers and, and I was going off to go visit them. And I just said to them, well, hey guys, if you want to come, you can. And they decided to come along on that trip. And um, wow, it was magical. I mean, it was really magical. I can tell you we got there <laughs> and uh, we got to one of the camps and the chief and I are very familiar. We have a very, very warm, affectionate friendship. And so I got there and they saw that, you know, they, they, this and that set them at ease a little bit because we're about to do an overnight camping with these you know, people. But um, we got there and we put the four bedrolls up and all of a sudden the three girls are like, uh... Eric only has two sides <laughs> who, who gets one of those sides because we're in the wilderness. We're not in a safari camp with, you know, like, you know, gates and stuff. And, and that night we're lying there and we can hear hyenas off in the distance. And uh, Karen, uh, um, uh, Karen's a good friend of mine. And, and she goes, she goes, what is it? And I go, it's, it, it, that's a hyena. And she goes, how close is it? And I said, <laughs> well, judging on the sound, I would guess about two kilometers or so. And she goes, oh, thank God. And I go, yeah, it would take it a good 15 minutes to get here. <laughs> <laughs> she's like like freaking out and but it was so, it was it was such a great trip and it made me feel especially for Yvonne our wild pit coach it made me feel that if I could bring our other coaches because we have about 500 coaches around the world currently it, that it would allow them to personalize some of the stories they hear me tell in our coaching programs and so forth and so yeah we started taking um we started taking small groups of our coaches and occasionally some of our friends um uh, you might be familiar for example with uh um you might be familiar with Paul Saladino that he wrote mm -hmm. the carnivore book and so on. I took him out to go visit them. And so we've been doing that now, basically about once a year, we take a, a group of people out and let them have that experience. And it's, it's pretty special because their way of life isn't going to last very much longer. So every time we go see them, we kind of, we, we kind of know we're heading toward the last one. Ah, uh, Oh, that's so hard. That's so hard to, to see, but, um, what a beautiful experience. So I definitely think I'll put that for folks as a, as a note. So guys at drjcrossnd.com in the podcast notes, we'll get some info on that too. Because when I heard yeah. that, I was like, how cool, how cool. Hey, Hell Junkies, wanted to tell you about my pal, Dr. Anna Marie Frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women. From anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones, as well as helping with sleep, she's got you covered. Plus, she has teas too. This day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happyholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not going to remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. So you were mentioning a little bit about some stories that you have in terms of folks. And and I think at this point for for a lot of people, you know, they think about how am I going to make the change? 
you know, I've I've read every book under the sun and I still never, you know, got some success. I want to hear stories of folks just like me. Can you share a couple of success stories so folks can kind of hear, you know, what you what folks go through, what kind of things they come in with and and how they end up at the end of nine weeks or or more, depending on how, how long they program they yeah. So I would I would start with this idea first. Let's talk about the stories of what didn't work. And and yeah. and, and it's a very important thing. You see, the, the vast majority of people, uh, as a matter of fact, the average person will undertake two diets a year through their adult lifetime, and they will stick with each one and for about seven days, and they will gain roughly three pounds every time they do that. And that's just that's just what's happening in the industry at the moment. And, and I can give some explanations as to why. The first thing is, is that if you go on any kind of baby bathwater diet, then you're you're going to use willpower to stay on that where you're like, basically, you're saying you have to avoid these things for the rest of your life or for the last rest of your diet. And people aren't good at that. So that 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 basically leads to an overreaction or a relapse. Then the next thing is, is that most of these programs are based on the idea of calories in and calories out, like calorie deprivation is the goal. No, it isn't. In fact, your body is perfectly capable of releasing weight when you are eating in a calorie surplus if you are communicating with your body that it doesn't need to gain weight. So the, the calories in, calories out argument is heavily flawed. Then the next thing is, is that they're all told to go out and do strenuous exercise because frankly, if they just ate a little less and moved a little more, which is, by the way, a soft drink industry meme, you know, and so now you have a bunch of people who are, you know, uh, you know, have, have sort of, uh, they're, they're undernourished. So they're basically starving, but they're overstimulated with sugars. And generally speaking, they've got inflammation in their joints and what have you, and you want them to go out and do a bunch of exercise. Well, then they're going to get an injury and, 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 you know, it, all of those things lead to disaster. So, so what we did really is created a framework that introduced people to incremental and subtle changes, additions, subtractions, and lifestyle changes that they, that they integrate along with exercises on a, on a, and when I say exercises, I mean mental exercises over a, a defined period of time so that those changes are integrated. They're not using willpower. We show them how to use effective willpower for short-term decision-making, but not for holding on. If you are holding on to not eating ice cream, I guarantee you're going to eat ice cream. Whereas if you are making the decision to avoid it for some period of time and you have really good um, uh, behavioral change behind that, somebody can offer you an ice cream. And a matter of fact, one of my clients well, early on, his name was Kurt, is, is Kurt. And Kurt, um, uh, you know, he, he had such a debilitating problem with ice cream. The way he would tell the story is that his wife would send him to the store to go and get some juice for the kids for the breakfast in the morning. And he would go out and in typical kind of guy fashion, he might get distracted and he might forget to get the juice, but <laughs> he would definitely come back with ice cream, even though there was already ice cream in the fridge. Like he had a definite issue with ice cream and he tried to give it up and he tried to use willpower and what have you. Well, funny enough, I was at an event in Stockholm. He's an Estonian guy, but I was at an event in Stockholm and he happened to be there and I was on stage and I, I just, I hadn't seen him in a long time. And he looked so different as you'll be able to see from the pictures. It was striking. Um, what happened at that stage was I, I asked him, hey, how do you feel about ice cream today? Now I hadn't seen him, so I didn't know the answer. I knew what I wanted the answer to be, but he goes, oh, I, I, I don't want it. And I go, well, Kurt, as it turns out, I have a thousand euros in my pocket right now and I will give it to you if you will eat a bowl of ice cream. And he said, no, absolutely not. That's clearly not willpower, right? That's a decision <laughs> to change. And, yeah. and so that's a big part of it. And by the way, um, his before after pictures are so, so striking that he bumped into a friend of his from the military um, and they had done military service together. They have mandatory military service there. And the guy said, oh my God, you haven't changed a bit since you were 19 years old. Now he's, you know, at that stage in his late thirties. And he oh, says, wow. well, you should see the middle picture. <laughs> you no, know, he's back to looking like he did when he was 19. Uh, another thing, by the way, relative to him was that um, he uh, he lost a dramatic amount of weight, which is obvious. But but the next piece is that he and his wife had um, they'd had two children and then they just could not seem to conceive like they tried everything, all the interventions and the IVFs and what have you. And they just weren't getting there. And they'd had a few miscarriages and 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 and, and what have you. And and um, and then, of course, after he went through the wild tip program and, you know, when you when you see that striking difference, you can imagine that what we're seeing on the outside is reflected on the inside as well. Well, no kidding, his, he and his wife just accidentally got pregnant after that. No other interventions, just getting their relationship with food correct. And, and, and this is the humbling part of it for me is they, they no kidding, they named the kid Eric. <laughs> uh, so that was, it was a very, um, that was early on in this whole thing. And it, 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 it hit me really hard. 
So, and, and then, and then more, and then another extreme diabetes story, which I think is really fascinating is there's, um, oh, now, now that I want to say it out loud, there's a disease, you might know the name of it. It'll come to me, I'm sure. Um, but where children, it's a genetic disease that children get where they have an insatiable cat appetite and they almost always end up obese and, and diabetic and, and generally don't live very long. And it's going to come to me in a second here. I always remember the name of it until I need to say it in this moment. But in any event, it'll, uh, the bottom line is, is that um, this one woman, uh, a Scottish woman living in uh, Iceland, um, she did wild fit and she did really well on it, which was tough for her because she was a candy manufacturer. So she didn't really, oh. you know, she, that was a bit bad news, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but she then came back and said, look, she's, you know, her child has this, this condition and, um, and the doctor said that it's, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. The child will gain weight. And what happens is the children, that the children with this condition, their appetites are so strong that you pretty much have to padlock the fridge. And then, then as they get older, you have to fight them away from the fridge. And when they get big enough, you probably have to put them in special care because you can't fight them and keep them away from the food. They will almost always end up type two diabetic and, and obese. And then, you know, they don't live very long and it's, it's very sad. Well, funny enough, she wrote to me one day and she said, uh, Crater Willie. It's yeah. called Crater. Okay. There it is. Okay. Uh, but you know, she she wrote me and said, "Look, something miraculous has happened. My son has lost twenty pounds, right?" And and of course, she'd been told that the, her son will never lose weight; he will only ever gain weight. And I said, "Really? Like how?" And she goes, "It was you." And I go, "Well, well, what, okay. Like no, mm -hmm. it, I don't know what's going on here." She goes, "Well." You know, in, in WildFit, we have a number of different ways of helping people in, uh, explore their internal dialogue and in relationship with food. I don't know if you've seen the movie Inside Out, um, but it's it's maybe one of the best ever movies on emotions that was ever made. I think it's like every parent and child should watch it huh. because it's very similar to the way we coach our WildFit classes, the, the way we represent internal sort of almost food personalities. And so he drew these food personalities himself and he put them on the fridge and so whenever the cravings would come up, he would walk up to the fridge and talk to the characters and then walk away from the fridge. Now, if he can do that, then the average, say, overweight woman of a, of a, cer of a certain age who's been struggling with her metabolism that has undefeatable cravings, if he can do it, <laughs> then those same tools, she's definitely going to be able to do that as well. And that's that's really been a major part of our success is that behavioral change aspect. Pe most people know roughly what to do to be healthy. They're just not doing it. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And and that's, I mean, that's what struck me, but with the book, just looking at the behavioral change and the personalities. And I, you know, I've been created my own. I was writing through and I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, we all have them. There's, it's incredible. Now, of course, I want to know like what, what, when you were going through this and creating it, what, what personalities came up for you around what foods? Just out of Well, you know, one of the things that I found out was that, um, and, and this is, it's a shocking thing that most people are quite stunned when they realize it. And, and so everybody listening, be prepared. You're about to learn something about yourself. <laughs> um, but most of us have had something along these lines where you're say, trying to be good about food, and you, you know, you show up at a party or you go through an airport or somebody brings donuts to the office. And so let's imagine that scenario. Somebody has brought donuts to the office and assuming donuts are inside your realm of eating, because some people simply don't eat them. But if, if you do eat them even a little, then what happens now is somebody brings donuts into the office and there's this immediate voice that says, hey, Jack brought donuts. And then the other voice kicks in and goes, yeah, but we're on a diet. <laughs> now, in that moment, you begin to realize there's at least two of you in there. <laughs> like everybody has a degree of multiple multiple personality disorder relative to food. Oh, I I I know we're on a diet, but but we've been so good. You know, we we've been so good. We deserve it. And plus, we've had a really hard day, right? So the, the, you've got this one voice that we call the food devil, who's like, you know, trying to manipulate you internally. Then you've got the angel who's basically ill-equipped to deal with this going, yeah, but a, 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 a moment on the lips is an inch on the hips. No, we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't do it. And as we all know, somehow the food devil wins most of the time. And so my personalities, when I went through this and first developed this idea, this, this sort of early stages of what we might now call food psychology, I recognized that I had some distinct personalities. One of them was the whiny guilt trip teenager. 
Come on. You haven't had it for so long. You've been so good. You deserve it. You only live once, you know, <laughs> everything in moderation. Come on. You know, like that whiny little voice inside and I could hear it. But then there's another one and it was even more deadly, even more dangerous. And that was the internal drug dealer. The internal <laughs> drug dealer is like, hey, they got donuts over there. <laughs> yeah, but we're, we're, we're like, we're trying to be good. We're not diet. Yeah, I know. I know. But listen, you can't live like that all the time. One bite isn't going to hurt. Why don't you just, why don't you just go cut yourself one bite? You won't eat the whole thing, right? You just have the one bite. We've all had that drug dealer say that shit to us at one time or another. Mm -hmm. And what's mm -hmm. fascinating is, and by the way, I'll bet you, there's a good chance you're going to get some people that are listening right now, writing to you going, after that episode, I heard my food devil. And once you've heard him or her, you create the possibility of gaining power over it. And that's a very important thing. That's huge. That's yeah. yeah. When I was looking at it, I definitely have the drug dealer. I've got, I've got the crazy Mary. I also have, <laughs> I got grandma. I'm like, wow, I have a lot of personalities and it depends on the food too. Cause if I'm talking like something like a pastry or something like bread, there's different things going on. Oh, yeah. just this, those two. And, and you think, well, pastry and bread would be very similar. Oh no, no, I got different, different thoughts there. Different personality for the, for the different drug. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> It's so funny. And so now I'm like, okay, I got to ask my patients now when I'm in the office, like, all right, what are the voices in your head? I want to hear them all and, yeah. and let's break them down. Cause it, it is that awareness. And then you almost start like you walk into the kitchen to go grab some, and then you're laughing at yourself now because you're like, ah, oh, I hear you. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, awareness is half the battle that, that consciousness, but there's an important thing too. A lot of people, when they first get introduced to this idea, they think that our goal is to weaken the devil and strengthen the angel. And mm -hmm. yeah, you, you can do that, but a weak devil will always come back. The real idea is to align the devil and the angel so that you're, they're not arguing anymore. So uh, as a good example, I had a terrible problem with Coca-Cola when I was a kid. I was drinking like, you know, six or eight bottles of Coke every day, plus a coffee over here. Like I had a serious sugar and caffeine problem when I was, say, 17, 18 years old. Um, today my food angel and food devil are completely aligned on this issue. There is literally the only thing we use Coca-Cola for in this house is cleaning the toilets. It's quite good at that. That's it. Like no, there's no debate. There's no discussion. There's no temptation. But even in that situation, like for example, I won't eat a donut. I just don't do that. Like I just, I just don't. And by the way, I'm not judging anybody who does. And, and we, and by the, a huge principle of wild fit is called food freedom. I believe that you and everybody else should be able to eat what they want, when they want, as much as they want, whenever they want. But I also believe that they should be able to not eat what they wish they wouldn't eat without feeling like they're missing out. So if we can if we can create that for people, then they've got food freedom. So as an example of this, uh, um, you know, I, I'm originally from from Canada, South Africa, but then Canada. And so in Canada, we have Tim Hortons, right? And I, I don't know what the equivalent in America is, Krispy Kreme and cross with Starbucks or something like that. But Tim Hortons is there, and and I, I I'm uh, I'm I'm. I, you know, I'm, I've lived in Canada a big chunk of my life and I drive past Tim Hortons all the time and no, my food devil doesn't say a thing about it. I don't go in those places. I'm not even interested. There's no temptation. But weirdly, about seven years ago, um, I was in Halifax for a few months because we were having a baby there and all this kind of stuff. And so, so, so I'm driving along and I'm driving down a street that I grew up on. And I'm driving past the same Tim Hortons that I used to go to as a child. So this is not just any Tim Hortons. It's the <laughs> one I would go to after the hockey game, after school, whatever, you know, that kind of thing, right? So, so I'm driving along and I come to a red light and my food devil goes, hey, they've got maple filled donuts in there. And then my food devil and angel literally burst out with laughing and laughter inside me. Like the, even the devil was laughing that he said it. It was like, <laughs> there was no part of it that was serious, but it was, it was proof that these emotional, uh, uh, nostalgic linkages, emotional linkages to food are so deep seated that even with my level of freedom, my devil for one second thought, maybe we'll get a maple fill. Of course we didn't. Right. <laughs> I, and I didn't have to use willpower not to do it, but it, it shows the power of, Hey, the food industry has hijacked our emotional states. They've sponsored our feelings. They've, they've hijacked our holidays. And so even when we've broken free of it, they're going to keep trying to get us to come back. 
Yep. I mean, the commercials, the state, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, I, I, I get it, but having this power to be able to align the, the food devil and the food angel, I have had that experience, not with Tim Hortons, but I have had that experience where there's just like, what, a bacon eater? Like, really? Why? Oh, oh my gosh. But yes, it's, it's crazy how industry and, and all of that and our marketing is, is there. And I think that's probably a really great topic for a couple of seconds for folks to really, you know, the, the, you know, what, like Arby's you can get four for a dollar or whatever. I'm making stories up because I don't even know. But these things are very poised to keep us eating and keep oh, us yeah. in that. And if we can break free from that, that's one of the main main things, at least how I work with a lot of my patients. Not saying you can never have it again, but breaking free from that cycle is spending lots of time in drive throughs One of the metaphors that we use for this with our clients is that um, we are, in, 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 quite, in almost a literal sense, we are living in captivity. Mm -hmm. And um, we're living in captivity. So, you know, we've been removed from our natural ecosystems. And, and there are certain advantages for that because our natural ecosystems are dangerous. There were big cats hunting us and, you know, all the, you know it, was, it was difficult out there. But what it also means is that we've turned over our sustenance. We've turned over our nutrition um, to the industry, as it were. And, and what's really interesting about, about captivity is that animals don't do well in captivity. I mean, except for maybe goldfish, but like really generally, I mean, <laughs> speaking of another fish, a great white shark will only last for days in captivity, maybe weeks, and then they die. Even if you re-release them to the wild immediately, they, they still tend to die. They, captivity is just generally not a good idea. And, and, and so we're in this position now where our food system is controlled by, and, and listen, I'm a capitalist at heart. I, I'm not, I'm not, at heart, I believe in some level of freedom of economy to, for people to innovate and create things. And I realize there are opposing views, but that's where I sit, except I believe that a capitalistic food system is, well, frankly, the death of us. And that's because we are dealing with uh, food manufacturers that are primarily concerned with profitability and not with public health. And that is a problem. There's no question about that. And so, you know, and, 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 I, I'm not suggesting that there's this one evil food executive that's trying to kill everybody. What I'm suggesting is, is that our parents' pension funds have invested in these food companies and the food companies are doing the best they can to make sure our parents' pension funds are working. So what are they going to do to do that? Boost profitability. How are they going to do that? Get people to eat more of their food, you know, and, and how are they going to do that? They're going to do it by manipulating our biochemistry, by creating addiction, by hijacking our holidays and emotional states, and by lobbying and, 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 and affecting legislation and food regulation. They're going to do everything they can to boost their profit profitability. It's not in itself an evil activity. It just doesn't serve us. So we, we need to form a different emotional response to these realities. And I'll give you such a good example of this, that, you know, one, one thing that anybody can do to start to improve them, their, their, their relationship with food is just get into reading ingredients. And if you can't pronounce that, you probably shouldn't eat it. I mean, that's a general idea, right? <laughs> but, but the other thing is, is that you begin to notice how prolific sugar is when you start reading ingredients. Uh, and, 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 and the ways that they deceptively try to hide sugar, you know, there, there are 180 different names of sugar, different types of sugar. And one of the reasons for that is, well, because there are terrible forms of sugar and better. So, you know, where Coca-Cola was bad enough when they had refined sugar in it in America, they switched to corn syrup, which made the stuff even more deadly, in my opinion. So, you know, it's it, so there's that reason for multiple names, but there's another reason for multiple names. And that is that let's say you're reading the breakfast cereal for your children, assuming you're still in that outdated model of feeding children breakfast cereal in the morning. And then you look at the fourth ingredient and you see that the fourth ingredient is, is sugar. And then the fifth ingredient is dextrose. Why? Why, why, why have they done that? Well, the reason they've done that, I suspect is not so much about flavor, but it has to do with the fact that if they used one sugar, then it would be way further up the list by splitting it into two sugars, they push it down to position six and seven. So it doesn't look like such a big deal. Whereas if they were combined together, ingredient six and seven might end up being ingredient two. And then a parent would look at that and well, I'm not giving that to my kids. So they're deeply manipulative, but here's the challenge now, consider this. Let's say you're working with one of your patients and you're like, you know, I think you should take a little holiday from sugar for a little while. So I want you to read the labels. And if it's got sugar in the top three, put it down. So they go pick up their you know, ragu tomato sauce or whatever it is they want to buy. And they look at the, the ingredient and they go, oh, look, sugar's ingredient number two. Now consider two different reactions. The first reaction is disappointment. Oh man, I can't have this. I can't have this because, you know, Janine said that I can't <laughs> have it. Now, 
that person is going to end up eating it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but they're going to. They're going to rebel against your instruction because people want to rebel. What if, on the other hand, they were angry when they saw it? Not at you, but at the company. What if they saw it and looked at that label and said, these manipulative buggers, I will not buy this. And they put it down. That is where freedom begins. It's the realignment of your rebellion. Most diets create a bunch of rules that people get dopamine for violating. Don't eat this food. The minute you eat it, you get a bunch of dopamine. What we want to do is align that rebellion so that people are rebelling against the food industry or at least the disastrous parts of the food industry. And, and this is an important distinction. We call it democracy by dollars or rubles or pounds or whatever the case might be. You, you quite literally are voting with your currency. And, and we know we, with absolute certainty that when people change their buying patterns, that the food industry will do what they can to drive profits the way consumers are asking them to do it. Now, a food company will try to do it through addiction and sugar and all that kind of stuff. But if you stop buying it, like here's a great example, bacon. Most people don't realize that bacon is just full of nitrates and sugar, like it's full of it. Most people don't know that, but you know what's really crazy? Now you're starting to see bacon labels. I have one here in the house right now. It says no sugar, not cured, no nitrates. Why did they do that? Because people started demanding it. We had this one client who uh, wanted to you know, experiment with a holiday from all sugars. I'm not suggesting that as a lifestyle. I'm suggesting that as an experiment. So, so she'd been eating these sausages and she went to her local butcher and said, hey, listen, um, can you tell me what you use for fillers? Because sometimes people use grains and gluten and, and syrups and stuff. She goes, they goes, no, we don't use any fillers, but we do have syrup. There's some syrup in the sausages. She goes, well, can you make a custom batch for me that doesn't, that doesn't have any syrup? They go, no, no problem. So they make her a custom batch. So this goes on for a few weeks where she would call up to get her custom batch. And one day she showed up at the store to pick up her custom batch. And they said, I'm sorry, ma'am, we aren't doing that custom batch for you anymore. And she goes, what? They were playing a bit of a joke on her because they go, because now our entire store is a custom batch. And she goes, what happened? She goes, we got another of these crazy wild fit people who called us and started asking us to take the syrup out of her sausages. And so my brother and I, who learned the recipe from our father, who learned it from his father, started asking, why is there syrup in here in the first place? So when we made your last batch, we took some of them home and cooked them and ate them and they were amazing. And so we realized there's no purpose in doing this anymore. And so because of two wild fitters, this one entire butcher eliminated syrup from their sausages. So that's that's a big part of this is that like vote with your dollars. Abs I couldn't express my yes. Yes, people. I can't express it more. I mean, it'll it'll change if we can all just work one step at a time. And like right there, yeah. starting with your local folks, absolutely. Oh, I love that story. I'm I'm like, whew, that just fires me up and gets me ready to go now. I'm like, what else can we change? Come on, Eric, let's do this. Let's get some more change going on. Speaking of that, though, you've got a lot of change going on, of course, you know, just impacting with this book and also just with the WildFit program. And I'd really love for folks to hear, you know, how can they get a hold of the book? How can they get into the WildFit program? You know, give them the whole scoop of how they can jump on board and really change their lives. For good. Sure. Well, the, the great news is, and there's a great opportunity, depending on when they're listening to this episode, if it's if they're listening to it fairly fresh, then there's a great opportunity. And that is that the first print edition of the post-diabetic book comes with a free place in our diabetes reversal program. That's a $250 video training program that guides you through a, 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 a very similar process to what's laid out in the book, but of course, with extra multimedia uh, support and documentation, and what have you. And it's, I think it's $247. Now for a $20 book, you get access to that. And so you can go pick up the book on Amazon and it'll have, it has a code right in there and you can go and sign up for the program immediately. Um, we also have uh, um, at postdiabetes.com, you can find out more about the book there and some of the programs that are there. And I think they have some kind of limited edition, buy the book and get some extra stuff with it. So rather than buying it from Amazon, you could also get it there. And then also, this is a very important thing is that some people are like, yeah, but I don't have diabetes. Well, maybe, maybe you don't. But what we can say is that something like seven out of 10 people that are, are currently um uh, living in, in, in the United States. For, and and I, we pick on America, but that's mostly just because they do stuff early and first, and they've got a lot of data. I think mostly 
we can say that what we're seeing in America with respect to obesity and diabetes is being mirrored in all the developing nations throughout the world. Um, but we're talking about seven out of 10 people being somewhere on that diabetic spectrum. And many of them don't even know. And so my recommendation is, is that um, we, we want to learn, this, this is maybe, the, this might be the most devastating disease in the history of earth. And I mean that, like, I know that sounds a little, a little like hyperbole, but what I would say is this, what most people don't understand about diabetes is that it immediately starts contributing to circulatory problems and energy management problems, which might in turn turn into weight gain, but it definitely does turn into circulatory issues that are gonna end up with numbness and amputation of fingers, hands, and feet. It also leads to the degradation and loss of eyesight young. And it is the number one risk factor for just about every other major cause of death, particularly heart disease, cancer, and respiratory disease. And speaking of respiratory disease, and you know, we're allowed to say this these days. Uh, it, it felt like you weren't allowed to say this about two or three years ago, but diabetes is one of, the, is and continues to be one of the most significant risk, risk factors to, relative to uh, 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 your response to, to a virus like COVID-19. People who weren't obese and didn't have diabetes, many of them got, got the disease and barely knew they had it. But if you were carrying that extra weight or if you were carrying extra sugar was the real issue, it was devastating. So there and and this is also I'm going to say something just a tiny little bit controversial, but all good. I analyzed all of the data that was coming out of the United Nations relative to COVID outcomes, and what I spotted, and I wrote about this on Medium. You can look my name up and go to Medium. I wrote about it. What I spotted was that while we already knew there was some correlation between obesity and and COVID outcomes, that 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 became pretty clear early in 2020. What I found out is that it's not a direct correlation. It's not simply a direct correlation. It's a correlation of um, uh, th there's a stepped correlation in in terms of the um, in terms of the spread of the disease. It, countries that have less than eighteen percent obesity rates, that is to say, that less than one in five people are obese, they had death rates from COVID lower than traffic accidents. The minute a country ticked up to eighteen percent suddenly they had these skyrocketing death levels. And there's a few different contributing factors to that. But one of the biggest ones is, is that if you aren't obese or if you weren't obese or you didn't have type 2 diabetes, you were not very good at passing the virus to other people. In other words, you need to have more than one in five people in the, in the, in the population with a compromised immune system, then the disease can spread. So, you know, whatever one thinks about vaccines and masks and all the other precautions, that's fine. But one of the biggest precautions that any population could ever take to prevent another COVID uh, pandemic from ripping through is eliminating diabetes and obesity from the population. Mm. Powerful information. Powerful information. Mm -mm -mm. So good. Can't even come up with anything after it. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Boom. You got it. So guys, you, you want to think about that. Just, just saying, because. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, just further to the original question, if, if, if you're not like, say somebody's not particularly concerned about diabetes, but they do want to improve their relationship with food and they never want to go on a diet ever again. And they don't want to feel tired at three o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe they got a couple of pounds they want to lose and, or they want to boost their sex drive and fertility or just feel better. Then they, they just jump over to getwildfit.com. We will guide you through a very well-constructed 90-day incremental process that will permanently alter your relationship with food. It'll change your neurology and habits so that you don't have to live a deprived life of self-control for the rest of your life. And you can have what we call genuine food freedom. Mm. That's so huge for so many people because I do think a lot of stress is is in that area. Even if someone doesn't have diabetes, even if someone, you know, the, yeah. just women in general, we're all kind of baddie up here <laughs> when it comes, you know, I'm not speaking for everybody, but I'd say a lot, a lot of women, myself included, it's, it's the food relationship is a tough deal. Let me give you one sort of funny but poignant example of this. Um, you know, first of all, weighing ourselves is 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 generally speaking a pretty big mistake. I don't mean that we should never weigh ourselves, but you know, weighing yourself on a daily basis is a little bit like investing in the stock market and watching the stock prices every single day. It has nothing to do with anything. It, it's only stressful. So, in, I, I, this is what I imagine the the scale is like for women. Many times is that first of all, you you, you gotta you gotta weigh yourself first thing in the morning before you eat. And also you got to go to the bathroom and get whatever's in there out. Then you might want to take a shower so you get all the dirt off. 
Then you got to make sure your hair is properly dry because you don't want the water to interfere. Then probably you should take off your jewelry and maybe even your earrings. And then you're going to walk over and then watch this. Women will often walk over to the scale gently. Like they'll, they'll walk lightly to the scale and then they'll lightly put their toes. Now you're kind of giggling about this, but I, I just said this at a conference a few days ago. And this woman comes over and she goes, do you have cameras in my bathroom? <laughs> Bye. Mm-hmm. There's a very important thing to know about that little funny thing. And that is that all of that behavior indicates fear and all of that behavior generates cortisol and cortisol slows down the release of weight. Mm -hmm. So you've got this daily counteractive activity that the vast majority of women are doing that actually makes it harder for their body to release the weight. It's it's terrifying. And, and the truth is it does not have to be that way. One really, you would have seen this in the book, I'm sure, but one of the things that we say in there I, 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 is that your body doesn't on its own want to carry any excess muscle or any excess fat. It will only carry as much excess muscle or fat as it determines that it needs. With muscle, it determines the need based on how much you use it. The more you use it, the body goes, well, we clearly need this. Mm -hmm. And with fat, it has everything to do with what you're communicating to your message about what season is coming next. So if you're eating in a way where your body deduces winter is coming, well, then your body's gonna slow your metabolism down, boost your cravings for more carbohydrates and start storing glycogen and fat to prepare you for that winter. And I've looked around and there are some people in North America that are certainly preparing. I think they're preparing for a coming ice age. They're definitely ready. And, and by the way, I don't mean that in any, I know that, I know some people go, oh, you're fat shaming. No, I'm not. I'm being realistic about the fact that it's unhealthy and that, it, and, and that it's not their fault. It's the fault of a disastrous food manufacturing system. But it doesn't really matter whose fault it is. It is up to us. It's our own personal responsibility to turn around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely am like quarter ice age happening at least is how I feel. So I, I need to, I need to look into some of this too for myself. And, and I think it's, it's hard, you know, as a doc, um, when you struggle with weight yourself to, to be able to recommend these things. And, and so now I'm like, okay, I'm on it. I'm working on this too. Cause Hey guys, we can all do it together. It's, you know, even you don't have doctors or nutritionists that are overweight for no reason. It's. Well, as you know, from reading the book, my co-author, uh, Ruben yeah. Ruiz, yeah. I mean, he would, 40 pounds overweight, type two diabetic and hypertensive running three medical clinics. And he used to be an assistant professor of medicine. And that was, and, and he's, and, and his comment to me, because he did our program. And by the end of that program, he'd lost 40 pounds, reversed his diabetes, reversed his hypertension and got off nine of his 10 prescription medications. And, and, and he came, he immediately called me and he, there's a few, he said, first of all, I had no idea this was possible. And that's shocking since I'm a doctor. Secondly, I am now the skinniest doctor I know because they all are looking like that. And, and thirdly, he said, how do we get your message out to the world? And that's why he and I co-author post-diabetic. And that's why I'm here too. It's, it's valuable information and definitely I'm taking, I'm taking it to heart too, because it, it's true. We have a lot of overweight. I mean, you look at the medical field block in the hospital for a second, you know, it's cortisol combined with, we're all waiting for the ice. Look at the food. Things. They feed the doctor in the hospital, vending machines full of refined sugar, corn syrup, and seed oil garbage. It's like, you know, doctors are there and listen, sometimes it seems like I'm a little critical of doctors. I'm not, I'm critical of their education. You know, the, I'm critical of the absence of nutrition training in their education, but they are there saving lives, working their, their, working like unbelievable hours under a phenomenal levels of stress that the average human being can never understand. And the only food that's convenient to them is the disastrous lowest bidder in the cafeteria and the vending machines. It's not their fault, but nobody's going to fix it if they don't. Exactly. Exactly. Strikes. Got to have a strike on the, the cafeteria, folks. That's. If I still worked in that situation, I did a few years ago, <laughs> but now I got to have a strike on my own. No, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to work on this. We're going to work on this. I'm not going to tiptoe to, to the scale anymore. Cause yeah, you were, you had eyes in my bathroom too. So, you know, you know, oh my goodness, Eric, thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait to put this podcast out and share all this information with you guys. This is just good stuff. And, and really it boils down to working on the behavior and, and that's going to get us the most results. So thanks again so much for coming on. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me.
Hey, Health Junkies. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E, nd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. All affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again.